Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we are going to be starting a brand new series here on the channel. This is going to be Carnades Dialogues. I've noticed that some of the most interesting conversations I have are not the videos themselves, but in the comments below the videos that not everyone gets a chance to see. So here I wanted to highlight some interesting comments and discussions that I come across there. To start the series off, we're going to take a look at the comments that fell below all of the Month of Paradox videos, talking about whether the paradoxes are veridical, falsitical, or antinomious. In this first video, we'll just look at that first section of paradoxes, the general paradoxes, with a lot of paradoxes from antiquity. So let's take a look. At the end of every paradox video, I ask you a question. Is this paradox veridical, falsitical, or antinomious? And you gave some great answers. In this video, I'm going to take a look at your answers and then give what seem to be the best answers from my perspective. So let's see. First off, we have the Horned Man Paradox. The general consensus here was that this paradox was falsitical. Friday the 13th said, It assumes that anything you have not lost is something you had to begin with. Just because I haven't lost a million dollars doesn't mean I ever had a million dollars in the first place. There were a few voices that said that it was antinomious, basically saying that it does follow from the premises, but the premises are false. However, it's important to note that something is only antinomious if it follows from the premises and getting rid of one of the premises would mean that we would have to restructure in some way our logical framework, our understanding of logic, at least by Quine's original definition. If you could just throw out one of the premises as clearly false or not something that's intuitive or something we accept in our logic, then the paradox is going to be falsitical and not antinomious. Next up, the paradox of the court. There was a lot of discussion around the paradox of the court, with all three answers being given and defended. Let's take a look. So, some people claim that it was veridical. Paul the Skeptic said that Euathilus is correct, because when Protagoras sues him, he's breaking the agreement. Friday the 13th said it's veridical, because in fact, both arguments are right, and it's not an exclusive or of which one is correct or not. He has a lovely thought experiment about ice cream, if you want to read it. And Fengardice said that it was falsitical, on the other hand, claiming that Protagoras can't argue that if he wins, then he has to pay, and if he loses, then he has to pay, because those are contradictory claims. While I don't necessarily disagree with the conclusion here, it seems that the argument is a little bit problematic. For example, if I want to show that P, it is completely valid for me to show that Q implies P and not Q implies P, and by the law of the excluded middle, either Q or not Q. So their arguments are valid, but it seems to me there is something falsitical here. There are also arguments that it was antinomious, claiming that if we do abide by the agreements or are beholden to the agreements, then it is the case that he has to pay and not pay. Harry Ray states a similar claim, saying that if we follow the rules of the agreement, it seems that we reach a contradiction, that he should both pay and not pay. Those were perspectives from the realist, nihilist, and Harry Ray. To me, it seems that the paradox leads to a contradiction, that you atheists must both pay and not pay. Therefore, it can't be veridical. Veridical paradoxes are only those paradoxes that lead to counterintuitive, but not contradictory, conclusions. If the court correctly ruled in favor of either party, that would just make the paradox falsitical, as one of the arguments that led to the contradiction was faulty. So it seems to me there's not a good argument for it being veridical. Now, for the paradox to be antinomious, we can't simply be able to deny that such a contract could exist without risking a significant portion of our belief structure. Now, if we were in a legal system that allowed for such contracts, and those were part of its structure, and this would in fact create a paradox for them, this would be an antimonious paradox. The problem is, we're not in such a legal structure, as some legal scholars commented on the video. And our legal system would have a way of dealing with this, such that the first time, Protagoras would probably be kicked out of court for not having grounds, but were he to bring the case again, he might have more grounds. So it seems that there's no reason to believe that such a contract would cause an actual paradox to 
be created. We wouldn't have an antinomious paradox because our legal system can deal with it without getting rid of some big central belief. But if we had a different legal system, this could be antinomious. This highlights an important difference between antinomious and falsitical paradoxes, namely that some paradoxes are antinomious under one understanding while falsitical under another. Next up, the dichotomy paradox. This, by the general consensus, was falsitical, and Savior put it very well. The sum of one-half, one-fourth, one-eighth equals one, basically the sum of two to the negative n from 1 to infinity converges to 1. The sum of an infinite series of numbers, or infinite number of terms, is not necessarily infinite. Make a unit square, cut it in half, pick one half and then cut it in half again if you're not convinced by this, or just walk somewhere. You can move distances. The arrow paradox. Generally the consensus on this one also was that it was falsitical. Crick put it well, saying the arrow is not moving. Coming from a physics perspective, I'd say it's falsitical, since movement has to be looked at compared to time to get a velocity or speed. So the paradox is already assuming a wrong view of how to view movement. Seems to make sense. While Zeno's paradoxes might have once been considered antinomies, we have long since gotten rid of those naive assumptions about movement, reality, and physics that caused them to be antinomies, and now they're merely falsitical. Once again, this is highlighting that interesting difference between falsitical and antinomious paradoxes, being that some paradox could be antinomious in the past, but now have been changed to falsitical. Next, we have the interesting number paradox, or the uninteresting number paradox. The general consensus here was falsitical. Harry Ray gave an interesting argument to the point that it could be made veridical with a different tweak. It does seem to me that the paradox is falsitical because we don't have a clear definition of interesting or uninteresting. And it's possible to be made veridical if we simply define all uninteresting numbers as interesting because they are uninteresting numbers. So, it seems this paradox can be avoided, but it does have the beginnings of the next paradox, which is going to be a little bit more problematic. So, Barry's paradox. There weren't very many comments on this. It's a tough paradox to deal with, and a tough paradox to understand. But I think Mike Samuel put it very well. It's falsitical according to intu intuitionist logic. No excluded middle. But antinomious according to classical logic. He goes on to explain why. The point here is that under our general understanding of logic, under our classical understanding of the way that logic works, this paradox is a problem, and it's antinomious. But if we somehow change our framework and can take those central beliefs out, we can make it falsitical. But we have to change our understanding of the way that defined is defined. So... There are other ways to resolve this paradox, other than turning to a different form of logic. For example, by using a Tarski hierarchy for definable. However, this is an antinomious problem for our intuitive understanding of definable. So, thanks everyone for the fantastic comments and the fantastic discourse going on. Keep up the great comments and stay tuned for the next video, where we'll take a look at the next set of paradoxes and your comments there. Watch this video and more here at Carnadies.org, and stay skeptical, everybody.